Good evening, friends and neighbors. Welcome to another First Friday event sponsored by the Town of Woodside's Volunteer Friends of Arts and Culture, otherwise known as the Arts and Culture Committee. So last month we had a wonderful musical string trio that's presented us some very wonderful music. And this evening, we have a different presentation for you. This evening, we have something regarding nature. But in nature, like string instruments, there's music to be heard if you're willing to stop and to listen. Now, as we begin our presentation and questions come to mind, use the chat form to drop your questions in. And at the end of Bill's presentation this evening, we will try to go through as many questions as you might have. Now, this evening we are lucky because Bill is the author of The Road to Fox Hollow, a great book which I've enjoyed and I hope many of you will as well. He is the president and co-founder of the Urban Wildlife Research Project and is known internationally for his work with wildlife. His work focuses on studying the behavior of the gray fox. Many people consider Bill to be one of the world's leading experts on the gray fox. He's been studying the behavior of the gray fox and on restoring local habitat, thus making the environment a healthy place for all wildlife to live, not just the gray fox. Now, Albert Einstein once said, look deep into nature, then you will understand every behavior and the world in a better place. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Bill, who will be sharing his view on the state of nature, not just gray foxes. Are you there, Bill? Yeah, I'm here. Um, and um, so shall we get underway? Let's get underway. Okay. So let's see here. This year, um, I'm going to take a, a, a high uh, view of uh, uh, what's happening in nature uh, right now as we uh, speak. And uh, so I think what we'll, get it, what we'll get into is this, human development, the, the sixth mass extinction and the gray fox. Now, how do they all go together? Well, let's unfold it all. Let's go way back, way back in the beginning of time. And in the beginning, before there were any humans on the planet earth, the earth was still alive with creatures of the air, the water, the land. There were, there were thousands and millions of, anyway, the earth has been home to over 5 billion different species and organisms, but 96% of all of those 5 billion that have come before us have uh, uh, become extinct. And so as it stands now, we currently share the earth with about 12 million other species. When I came across that number, it was like, whoa, now wait a minute. Contrast that with 5 billion, and we're now living with 12 million other species? Okay. Um, that's a, 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 a vast difference. 400 million years ago, the first four-legged creatures began to evolve. That's only 400 million years. That's pretty recent when it comes to geological time. And modern humans, you and I, evolved from archaic humans only 200,000, 150,000 years ago in Africa. We're, we're youngsters on this planet. 
And yet what we've done with the planet is staggering. Now look at this. One of the, pop, uh, the, the, the world's population, the population growth of the human race is a major part of the problem. And so if we look up here at this number, we have as of fall 28, 22, 2022, 8,786,219 people. And that's continuously rolling forward. I mean, that, that number doesn't stop. So by now it's even more than we have. So here we have down in the uh, right hand, uh, left hand corner, um, the semi nomadic area when when people were beginning to settle down a little bit into um, their own uh, enclosure um, uh, and uh, uh, still going out and and hunting. And that's in the late Pleistocene era. Okay. Um, you know um, hi, sorry to interrupt you. This is Tom. I um, hate to interrupt you, but um, we're not seeing your screen. So if you could share that, perhaps you forgot to do that, but it's not showing. Okay, let me do, let me, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. No, no, that's okay. Um, where is, I got to go to... Um, try, okay, here we go. Now, can you see it? Yes, we can. Thank you, Bill. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Did we lose the first part? It's okay. That's okay, we'll start right, right here. Um, anyway, let me, let me go uh, here and go here. Okay, we're still on? Yes, we are still on, thank you. Okay, all right, all right, I got it. Anyway, I was saying uh, about the semi-nomadic era, this, this is when, uh, in the late Pleistocene, when people started to settle down uh, from their uh, ordinary nomadic life of, of moving from place to place to place, okay? And uh, again, we've got uh, from that period in history all the way up to the present time, we, are, we have increased our uh, population globally to 8 billion people. Now that is an important number. Anyway, the hu humans evolved with, let's go back, way back in time, okay? Because I think this is important for us to understand uh, that uh, humans uh, evolved in harmony with the natural world. Uh, human, human beings, as we evolved, uh, into becoming who we are today um, evolved in concert with the uh, natural environment. There was no separation between the two. And I want to tell this story about this Aboriginal shaman. Back in, the back in 1981, I returned from, uh, uh, as a part of a delegation to the People's Republic of China. And what happened out of that trip was that uh, uh, at UC Berkeley, um, Ruth Inga Hines, Stanley Krippner, myself, and two other uh, uh, people um, uh, began the um, uh, conference, the International Conference on the Study of Shamanism and Alternate Modes of Healing. And in the process of that, Ruth Inga, who was a, a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, invited uh, this shaman, this Aboriginal shaman, and I no longer remember his name, 
Uh, but uh, he came to UC Berkeley and spoke with us. We did not stay in a room somewhere. Almost immediately, he suggested that we go out in, onto the campus and find ourselves a nice place to speak. And so we, we went out onto the campus. And at that time, there was a, uh, a eucalyptus grove not far from uh, Ruth Inga's office. And we wound up there in that uh, 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 almost a forest of eucalyptus trees. And in the discussion that we were having about uh, nature, about the environment and, and so forth, somebody asked, how do you relate to nature? For that man, that question was a shock. He fumbled over his words. He tried to uh, get a hold of the idea of how do you relate to nature. And in the end, he said, he said, I, I don't understand your question. I, I can't grasp what you're trying to say to me. And it dawned on me at that moment that what he was saying, that he was such an integral part of the natural environment that he lived in, in Aus Aboriginal Australia, in a, in a group, that the question meant nothing. He was nature. And that's the way in which things had begun. But there came a point in time when we had a separation from nature be begins. And that separation from nature began with the naming, by naming nature, humans separated themselves from it. Once you put a name on something, you give it the qualities of other. And when you do that, you separate yourselves from. Not only that, but 75,000 years ago, we humans were prey to uh, saber-toothed tigers and a whole lot, a whole menu of other uh, really, really big wildlife. We were prey. And so what we had to do uh, about 75,000 years ago, as, as uh, language began to emerge, was we put ourselves behind walls. And by so doing, we created the walled, walled cities. This is thousands of years of time that has passed. We gave, we, we gave our, we had to wall in our cities. And one of the reasons for that was not only as protection from other people, but it was also protection from the uh, wildlife that would make us dinner. We humans make we humans di uh, their dinner. And so we increasingly withdrew from nature as a part of that whole process. Until thousands of years later, we get to the 19th century, and this picture depicts very, very well what was going on. You see the magnitude of the increase in population. And so it continues to increase. And from the beginning of agriculture, to hear the Anthropocene, this is, this, is, this is the age of the human, the Anthropocene. And in about 10 to 12,000 years, we went from villages like this one that's depicted here on the left to vast, vast cities. And that is a very short period of geological time that that took place. And in the process, the sixth mass extinction began. 
Let's take a look at that. Species extinction and human population. Look at that. They parallel one another. Here we have in uh, the blue, we have human population. And here in the uh, orange, we have extinctions. And it continues and continues and continues to this very day. Since 1970, we have lost about 68% of all wildlife on earth. That's a very short period of time to be losing so much wildlife. And so then more than a million species are at risk of extinction globally, many within decades because of human activities. I wish I could read, I wish we could read all of these here, but the human expansion, we're building out into forests, building permits uh, are issued uh, that uh, destroy habitat. And Governor Newsom last year, I think it was, signed a bill that allowed that to be ha happening across our state. And what that does is it increases the crowding and less food for all. And what that does when you have less food for all, it causes severe stress fighting and it affects the birth uh, rate in a downward spiral. This is happening globally. This is not just simply happening in our country. This is happening around the world. And so we have to take a look at the carrying capacity of planet Earth. The population to reach 9.8 billion by 2050 and 11.2 billion by 2100 is unsustainable. Because when we get up into that region, uh, we, 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 we're going to have problems with climate change. We're going to have problems with food production. We're going to have problems with uh, communications. We're going to have problems with the network of uh, getting goods from one part of the world to the other. And in the process, Mother Nature and Father Nature is fighting for its life. And part of that in my own speculations comes down to this. We have, we are living within a pandemic and we are living within a, an unsustainable population on the planet earth. And all of the ramifications that we can see um, and experience is that um, we have forest fires, we have cyclones, we have you know, tornadoes, we have all kinds of weather related uh, problems that uh, we're having to uh, deal with like we've never had to deal with them before. And that will only increase. And so that's part of what I mean by when I say Mother Earth is fighting for its life. So when we, in, when we get into the, into the wildlands and build out those houses and things, it's almost like in, in this picture, I, I, I envisioned a wave of homes being built over this landscape that is untouched here, almost untouched. And we have to somehow get that under control because the loss of biodiversity, biodiversity, I, I, think, I think probably a lot of people uh, don't uh, know what that means. Biodiversity is all of the insect life that is uh, uh, working um, all the time on, um, uh, like, like for instance, uh, the uh, hummingbird 
and its relationship to pollen. B, honeybees and its relationship to pollen. It causes a loss of species when we have a loss of biodiversity. And according to the World Wildlife Fund, our relationship with nature is broken. Biodiversity and the rich diversity on uh, Earth is being lost at an alarming rate. This loss affects our own health and well being. Today, catastrophic impacts on people and the planet loom closer than ever. And that makes it more important. Now, I, I put this in here because when I first saw this, I went, oh my God, look at that. That's the way we have chopped up our country. You go to Europe and you have something very similar to this as an image and overlay this in with your imagination and to the, the railroad system that covers our country too. And we've chopped it up even more. And this dividing up of, of landscapes is one of our biggest problems. This is Interstate Highway 90 near Drummond, Montana. And the reason I'm showing this is because on the next slide, we're going to see what happened when a grizzly bear, pollard grizzly bear, tried to cross this highway. And this, this highway is typical of highways all over this country. And here's what that grizzly bear did. Down here in this blue spot was where, whoops, 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 got to go back. <laughs> Down here in this blue spot was where the um, uh, grizzly was tagged, collared. And then it went off and in these orange uh, uh, pathways here, uh, was its movement. If you see there, 11-15-2020 to 12 10 2020 it moved through that landscape there, trying to get across Highway 90. And these X's are approaches that it took to, um, to come up to the highway, but then turn back. The green, however, is another attempt. And that green leads the, the grizzly over that period of time over here to a bridge that it used to cross Highway 90 and get to where it needed to go. You see, it was, it was originally here in this blue spot that it, was, uh, that it called home. And um, I suggest that it, uh, by implication, that it wanted to get back to its, uh, its original um, territory. But you see what we're doing, we're, we're, we're stymieing the um, passageway and the health and the growth of the um, uh, wildlife. And uh, th this, it has implications when it comes to mating and reproduction of the species. And so we need to increase our wildlife crossings or Interstate Highway 93, as you see here. Uh, and uh, we are beginning here in California to uh, build wildlife over crossings, but it's taken us a long time. Montana, uh, I, Nevada, and Idaho have led the way. They have far more wildlife over crossings than we do here in California, and we're a much bigger state, you know? So it's finally, finally getting to the point where we're going to build these. And I'm working on a project down in Coyote Valley right now that uh, where Metcalf Road crosses Highway 101 in South uh, San Jose and Coyote Valley, 
that we will transform that uh, uh, Metcalf Road into a wildlife crossing so that the elk that live in the eastern side, the Diablo range of mountains, can cross over 101 and come into the Santa Cruz mountain range. And in addition to uh, building that overcrossing, we're also going to translocate X number of elk into the Santa Cruz mountain range so that the gene pool of the ones from the uh, uh, Diablo side, uh, the Eastern side will uh, be able to uh, mate with the ones on the, on the Western side and the gene pool will become more and more healthy as time goes on. So the gray foxes in the Palo Alto Baylands Preserve. What I wrote here is that essentially, if we fail to do this, uh, we're going to lose so much. Like for instance, this, this uh, wildlife uh, trail here, that, that is a uh, fox uh, track and a raccoon trail that leads through this uh, greenery into the brush uh, beyond. Well, in, in November and December of 2016, I started getting um, emails from Cody over at the Animal, Sur Animal uh, uh, Services, and he was saying, uh, Bill, did you know that we have um, uh, had a dead gray fox brought in? And I hadn't known that. And so Cody and I started to work together and um, one after another, after another, uh, they kept right on coming and we had no idea why. We did not know at that time that canine distemper was slaughtering all 25 gray foxes that I had monitored for upwards of six years. And they, they were, they were dying, as you see this gray fox here on the, on the uh, cart. So what can you do with the, all of this? You can, you can personally join and donate lo to, to local nonprofits that are on the ground working to stitch together a local habitat, like my organization, the Urban Wildlife Research Project. We're working with the city of Mountain View on building in um, habitat that will um, be uh, hopefully uniting um, the uh, Palo Alto Baylands uh, foxes and wildlife over into the um, uh, Mountain View side near shoreline and all the way to Stevens Creek, um, Stevens Creek, okay. Anyway, you can get involved uh, with the grassroots ecology, environmental volunteers, MidPen. There's so many things that you personally can do. And you can keep track of the Paris Agreement and what's happening there because they, they are doing the global work that is necessary. 30 by 30, this is a national initiative, but it is also Gavin Newsom has, has uh, uh, set up a um, 30 by 30 website that is dedicated to California. And then the Kun Kunming uh, Montreal Agreement, that's another thing that uh, uh, is the some of the some of the big issues, some of the big questions are being uh, brought there, and then the local people uh, like ourselves are fulfilling some of which some of some of the um, larger questions by uh, stitching back together the local habitat. We have to do that. And so I think it's our moral duty to build back 
biodiversity and build back wildlife's habitat, build back the landscapes so that all critters, large and small, terrestrial and in flight, have places to freely move across their ancient landscapes once again. After all, we created that deadly landscape that they presently are forced to inhabit. We must correct our short-sighted view of nature. It is our moral duty to dedicate ourselves to the survival of all sentient beings. And remember, if we go back to that Aboriginal shaman back there at UC Berkeley, he would never understand what I have just written there on that side. He could not, he, he, he was nature. There's no doubt about that. And so we end this with, uh, my name is Limos. This is one of the gray foxes that I am monitoring now. Uh, Limos is the male and his uh, partner is uh, Big Eyes and she's um, out there with him. And I'll say one thing about these two, Limos and Big Eyes really like each other. I can tell that by their behavior. Once in a while, what will happen is that Limos will uh, set up a situation where he chases Big Eyes. And then Big Eyes gets into a situation uh, in that chase where she turns the tables on him and she chases him. Obviously, they are having fun. But anyway, um, as, it, as it says up there, I'm a sentient gray fox. And thank you for helping us. And so that ends my presentation this evening. I hope it was informative. And if we have any questions, um, I will be willing to uh, try to uh, answer. Wow, thank you so much, um, Bill, for a very informative and stirring uh, presentation. It's um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, your your program this evening kind of mirrors what uh, sixty minutes covered last uh, last Sunday in their broadcast. They talked about uh, mass extinction that's happening. So. It's definitely a very timely uh, subject. I'm sorry yeah. about the distemper that went through and took so many of your four-legged friends there. That was a very sad, sad part of your, your story. But out of that um, sadness comes uh, information and knowledge, which is hopefully important and we'll see uh, progress because of that. So um... one, one, one of the things about that is that uh, when, when that die out happened, okay, uh, of course, nobody was expecting it to happen. But when that die out happened, I got to thinking, okay, what caused this to happen? And uh, we put together a uh, pretty large puzzle. And uh, what it came down to was that uh, uh, the uh, gray foxes had nowhere to go. So they crowded up into two different areas of the Palo Alto Baylands. And I mean, they really crowded up the, uh, the uh, area. And that made it possible when the canine distemper arose uh, for it to spread far more quickly than it would otherwise. And so um, that generated in my thinking okay, what we need to do is to uh, increase the habitat out here, and we need to um, uh, connect the corridors and the pathways that these wild critters uh, use 
throughout the Baylands. And so we're working from, we're starting off at uh, 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 Facebook and we're going to knit together the whole uh, area between Facebook and Moffett Field. And if I can get into Moffett Field, we'll go through Moffett Field and into Sunnyvale. Well, there's a question from one of our uh, neighbors and viewers here this evening is, what is the current state of canine distemper and what can be done about it? Oh. To the reason why so many coyotes in San Mateo County have disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have uh, um, been going through a, an epidemic, if you will, of um, canine distemper in various places uh, throughout the Bay Area here. Um, and um, Jonathan Young up at the uh, Presidio has been tracking uh, that uh, progress of canine distemper. So what can we do? Not when, when we had the die out in 2016, uh, one of the first questions I asked the state uh, veterinarian, Deanna, um, I asked her, I said, where did it come from? You know, what, what is this? And she said, we don't know, but it looks like it's endemic to, the, uh, to California because she said, I get reports of die-outs happening across the state every year, not as large as yours, but she said, we get uh, enough and it's all canine distemper. It seems to just erupt right out of the ground. Um, uh, it could, because the, the issue became too, was it that uh, 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 a dog that had canine distemper, did it transfer it onto the foxes? The answer to that is no. Well, that's good to hear. Um, and then one of the other questions we have is, is there evidence of animals like the saber tooth tigers preying on humans, human bones gnawed upon? Mm. Not at the present time, but uh, part of the war on wolves is that uh, um, it, 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 the, the thinking and the emotional lives of people, um, uh, they still see the wolf as a, a, a danger. And if you look back in, uh, through our uh, fo folk history, uh, anytime a wolf, a little red riding hood, good example, you know, of uh, how we fear um, the, um, the big ones, okay? And uh, when, when I go to Montana and live back in the wilderness for a period of time every year, um, we come across uh, grizzly bears. Those are awesome, awesome uh, beasts. But we're not seeing where people are being attacked. Okay, I think I think that's the, the that's the bottom line. Well, I know that uh, many uh, paleontologists feel that man was the caused the demise of the saber-toothed tiger. So uh, I'm not sure it was the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, remember folks, if you have questions, please put them in the chat form. That makes it uh, easy for us to um, respond and have Bill um, reply. Now, the, the foxes that you've been studying for a long time and um, now, how many do you think you have in your um, study area at this time? Because I know after the big um, die-off in 2016, as you wrote in your book, Road to Fox Hollow, um, about that very sad event, uh, how many have you found in your area now? Well, <clears throat> two, Limos and Big Eyes. Um, they are the only two that have come out of the um, uh, the shoreline area, and uh, because when they came, they found an area that had, there were no uh, other foxes. So what they did almost immediately was they set up uh, their territory, 
And they do that by using their scat, their scat or their poop. Um, uh, that, that marks their territory. And um, so once that territory is established, most of the foxes, most of the time, do not allow another fox to enter into their, their territory. About, ooh, what was it, maybe two or three months uh, after um, uh, Limos and Big Eyes uh, marked out their territory, a little trespasser, a little female trespasser came into the area. And immediately what, what Limos and Big Eyes did was they tried to chase this little, we, we came to call her flop because she had a floppy ear and that ear had a tag in it. And anyway, so they chased her, they made life miserable for a flop. And finally, after about a month and a half of uh, putting up with the, these two foxes chasing after her to drive her off, she left. She went back to Shoreline and I get an email one day uh, from the uh, folks over at Shoreline asking, "Do you have you guys been tagging uh, these uh, the foxes coming through at your place over there?" And I wrote back, "No, we haven't. Why?" And uh, the reply was, "Because we we were uh, live trapping these uh, uh, feral cats, and uh, we we accidentally caught." a uh, gray fox and it's a little female. She has a floppy ear and she has a tag in that ear. And I wrote back and I said, what's the number on that tag? And they wrote back, I don't remember what it was, but they wrote back and gave the number. And I said, oh, that's flop. She was over here a little while back, but she left and she went back home is what she actually did. And then, um People are asking about, well, unfortunately, um, poisons that are used to for rats and other um, animals that human refer to as pests. Are you seeing um, any foxes loss in the area that you're studying? Not, not any foxes, but um, about four days ago, I was uh, taking care of the uh, trail camera array, array that I have uh, out there at the Baylands. And I came upon a dead owl, a barn owl. And I examined that uh, owl um, pretty thoroughly. It bled from the inside out because its beak, its beak was part, part, way open and there was blood coming out of it. The only thing that I can think of was that owl had caught a rodent that was, uh, that had uh, uh, poisoned, the, the, the rodent had been poisoned. The owl uh, found the uh, rodent and ate it and died. That's the way that whole thing works. And that's why we have to get off of those poisons. I think, I think the, the, when, when I've seen this happen, when they build a new uh, complex of any kind these days, around the perimeter, they always put these black boxes with the poison in it. Why? Do they have any proof that there are rats around? No. It's just a knee-jerk kind of part of the of, of building a new complex. Well, I know in your in your book, Road to Fox Hollow, you mentioned in there how you um, worked with uh, an organization to get them to stop uh, using uh, poison like that. So. Mm -hmm. Anytime I can, I will. So we have someone um, who's a docent at Jasper Ridge and saying how much they appreciate um, what you've been sharing and that it your story helps change perspective about the facts, about the largest human perspective, something like, how can we do this to ourselves? 
And yeah. they quote Chief uh, Seattle's words um, about, uh, it makes me sad to talking about that, but um, yeah, earth is our mother. Whenever befalls the earth, befalls the sons of the earth. So yeah, mm -hmm. enough there. So uh, yeah. Yeah, I think um, what you've spoken about this evening is a very important subject that um, people need to um, know about. And now you've, you've mentioned other organizations and people can certainly um, reach out and discover your organization on your website if they wish to uh, support it or get more information as a way of trying to find out um, more about what your activities and what's going on, not just with foxes, but with the area, because you are the man who made quite a discovery. Would you like to talk about your aquatic discovery that you found? Okay, um, well, back, back in, um, I, I believe it was March, I'm gonna have to recheck that, but it, I think it was in March. Um, I got a tip uh, from uh, a friend of mine that uh, there may be a beaver uh, down on Matadero Creek. And he wasn't sure, he only saw a quite large animal with its back to him and he he wasn't sure what it was and i said well, okay show me where you saw this okay and uh he did and i decided okay i'll put a trail camera in here it wasn't exactly where he saw it but it was nearby okay and it was the easiest place for me to access anyway so i put a trail camera in there and um, about a week of having that trail camera in there and, and seeing nothing but wood rats and possums and uh, a few other critters, uh, raccoons uh, coming through, bingo, there was a beaver. And I couldn't mistake it, the, the ranger and some of the other people that uh, I announced this to said, oh no, it, it sh you, show us a picture of it. It's probably a nutria, which is an invasive species, uh, or it's a, a, a muskrat. I said, no, no, this is a beaver. And I sent them the picture. These were city folks, okay, Palo Alto city folks. And I, I sent them the picture and sure enough, we went for about um, a month or maybe a little bit more than a month. And um, all that while I had been getting pictures of a single beaver coming up right by that camera. And then one night, two beavers showed. And obviously it was a male and a female and they were occupying that creek. That was the first time in 160 plus years that beaver have ever been on Matadero Creek. Well, that was, um, <laughs> that was an amazing discovery. We have a, a viewer who is, would like to know this question. Would beavers willingly stray into brackish water or would a beaver stay up in a bit higher elevations where the water is fresh? Well, they will travel in brackish water. They'll travel in the, uh, in the bay itself, salt water. Um, I, I don't know what they're, uh, whether they like to or not. Um, I have no idea. I'm just getting to be uh, learning about beavers myself. I mean, I had no need to until these two popped up and wow. And so now I'm, I'm trying to catch up on beavers. So um, people are wondering, how can we manage uh, rats and rodents without poison? Um, do you have some suggestions? Yeah, get an owl box. Um, get an owl box, put it on your property and um, the owls will come. And they 
uh, owls will scoop up in uh, a given night, an adult barn owl will scoop up six, uh, six to eight um, uh, rodents per night. That's better than your poison will do. That's been shown, okay? And so you get yourself a predator uh, in the area and you let that predator do the work and not the poison. I like that idea. I like uh, had an owl box on our property here for a while until the, the wind knocked it out of the tree, but uh, have to think about um, putting another one up because uh, yeah, I'm a firm believer in uh, not using poisons, but as a way to uh, try to use owls and other things uh, to make sure that the rodents go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I'm not I'm not convinced that rodents are as big a problem as we uh, as, uh, think they are. Um, we we always when we say rat, I think a lot of people uh, think of the uh, Norwegian rat, the big invasive species that inhabits New York City, as just one example. Um, uh, it, that, that's not that's not what we have around here. We have wood rats mostly, and they're they're sometimes called pack rats, and they are a basic food supply for the predators. Well, I know that there's definitely uh, Norwegian rats around. I've personally seen them, so um, they're out there. Um, do uh, barn owls do well in a suburban uh, neighborhood? Yeah, we've got we uh, out there at the Baylands in the um, urban piece of the Baylands. There are let's see one two three four five five owl boxes in various locations out there, and um, the high tech. Uh, area out there does have poison boxes, and uh, I've been, well, I did it once before, but i got to go back to it, uh, try to get them to remove those boxes. Hmm. Um, we have someone who has a friend who lives in a wooded area of Woodside and recently discovered what she thought was a cat because of hair that was left around. And it turns out it was a fox that has been curling up on a chair outside. Mm -hmm. And she was wondering if she should be concerned about it or how to avoid problems with this animal who seems very comfortable. There's, there's nothing to worry about. I, I would say just simply enjoy the, the presence of that, uh, of that fox. They are timid. Um, you get too close to them and they'll run in the other direction. They are benign when it comes to uh, we human beings. Um, and so just relax and enjoy them. I, one of, one of, one of the, I, I get every once in a while, I get an uh, invitation to come up and check out a gray fox. The one, uh, one fairly recently was uh, up in Los Altos Hills. And I went up there, checked out the uh, uh, area around the home and uh, made some recommendations uh, to the uh, landowners. And when I was about ready to leave, um, the well, woman, Davey, uh, said, uh, what can I do to help you? And I said, I need an administrative assistant right now. And she said, oh, I think I can do that. She's run businesses and things before. And so uh, I brought her into the circle and uh, she has been an invaluable part of our organization. Um, yeah. Yeah, volunteers. That's what the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee is all about. Um, yeah. Now, are there any drawbacks? We're getting a lot of owl questions here, Bill. So um, 
hope you can understand that. Are there any uh, drawbacks to having uh, barn owls uh, around noise, poop, anything like that? The only thing I can think of, and it's not really a big problem, is uh, that they, uh, when they eat uh, a rodent, they regurgitate the, uh, fur, uh, ball, the fur ball, okay? And uh, once in a while, uh, you can get splashes of poop in an area where they roost. Uh, but other than that, no, I don't know of anything. Great, well, um, Bill, I just wanna thank you so much for your encore presentation here this evening. You've definitely created a lot of questions um, from people and hopefully um, I can see uh, Amazon being uh, flooded with people wanting uh, owl boxes to put up on their properties. So uh, thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. So um, once I, again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wanna thank you for Tom, attending Tom, this evening. Tom, could, oh. I, could I just drop this little bit in? Sure. Um, you said there was a docent from uh, Jasper Ridge? Yes. Uh, listening? I want to just tell that docent that I'm going to be giving a talk at Jasper Ridge sometime probably in January, maybe February. Um, Liz Hadley and I have not nailed that one down yet, but uh, I will be giving a talk up at uh, Jasper Ridge. And that will be a live one. Great. Well, once again, um, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to share your wonderful information with all of us. Greatly appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for joining us um, this evening. Hopefully you've all stayed dry and are prepared for the rain that's about to come again. And remind you that next month, our presentation will be by the Putnam sisters who will be talking about preparation for the garden coming in the spring. So thank you all again for joining us and just a little couple of things to exit with. Men have forgotten this truth, said the fox, but you must not forget it. You become responsible forever for what you have tamed. And that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of people certainly have been dealing with the rain, but I will end this evening's presentation with a quote from Roger Miller, great songwriter. And he wrote, some people walk in the rain, others just get wet. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy your walk in the rain getting more than just wet. So thank oh, you again yeah. this evening. Take care of each other. And once again, thank you for joining us this evening for Woodside's Art and Culture's presentation with Bill the Fox Guy. Thank, you for, the, thank you for the invitation. You're always welcome, Bill. Good night.